it's difficult to imagine that 10,000 years ago, right here in North America, there lived giant animals that are now the stuff of legends. Mammoths and mastodons, ground sloths and saber-toothed cats. They and thousands of other species have vanished from the earth. And today, partly due to the expansion of one species, ours, animals are going extinct faster than ever before. The very definition of extinct means gone forever. But what if that didn't have to be? As we first reported in early 2010, scientists are making remarkable advances that are bringing us closer than ever before to the possibility of a true animal resurrection. The story will continue in a moment. wouldn't be dazzled by an animal like this, the woolly mammoth, or the saber-toothed tiger, the Irish elk, the giant sloth. Today they exist just as bones in museums, alive only in our imaginations and the recreations of artists and filmmakers. But what if that could change? In the age of DNA, we now know that these vanished creatures, like all life on Earth, are ultimately nothing more than this. Sequences of the four letters, A, C, T, and G, that make up the genetic blueprint or code of life. The codes for extinct animals were thought to have died along with them until recently, when machines like this one at the Smithsonian's DNA lab started working magic. Just the study of ancient DNA only broke onto the scene 20 years ago or so. The idea that we could harvest DNA from extinct creatures, from fossil bones, learn something about the past. Sean Carroll, a professor of molecular biology and genetics at the University of Wisconsin, says that like so many things in the field of DNA, the progress has been staggering. One surprising discovery has been the value of ancient hair. Scientists recently discovered that the hair shaft seals DNA inside it like a biological plastic, protecting it and making hair a rich and plentiful source of genetic information. Does that mean that you can take extinct animals? I mean, there's hair in museums. Right, yeah. And get the genetic sequencing. Possibly, and especially if those, mammal, if those animals were preserved in any way, there's a good prospect of that. It's sort of like CSI, you know, how good is this forensic material? Can you get good yeah. DNA information from older and older and older material? That's pretty promising. So dusty old specimens that have been tucked away in the drawers of natural history museums like the Smithsonian are suddenly potential treasure troves of genetic information. Just a couple of years ago, using only a few clumps of woolly mammoth hair, scientists at Penn State were able to extract enough DNA fragments to figure out most of its genetic sequence, making the woolly mammoth the first extinct animal to have its genome decoded which raises the question of whether resurrecting one of these creatures is really possible. Scientists say one option would be genetic engineering. Take a living animal that's related to the mammoth, like the elephant, figure out all the places where its DNA differs from the mammoth's, and then alter the elephant's DNA to make it match. That's not possible just yet. But there may be another way, cloning. Is it possible that we're going to get the full DNA of the woolly mammoth and be able to clone it? Yes, I think we'll be able to get much, if not all, of the woolly mammoth DNA. And the great advantage there is that a lot of the specimens are in permafrost, so they've sort of been conveniently frozen for us, which preserves DNA, preserves tissue better. But for cloning, just knowing the DNA sequence from hair isn't enough. You'd need an intact mammoth cell which Carol says will be difficult to find, but not impossible. It could be a skin cell, it could be any particular cell that hopefully has been preserved well enough, stayed frozen for thousands of years, and to transfer the nucleus of that cell into, for example, a, an egg of an elephant. And they're close. Close enough, that, close enough. Close enough that maybe the elephant could serve as a surrogate mother. It's called interspecies cloning, implanting DNA from one species into the eggs of another and anyone who wants to try it, with a mammoth or anything else, would be well served to pay a visit to Dr. Betsy Dresser in New Orleans. 
tucked away on 1,200 acres of land that seemed part Serengeti, part high-tech medical facility. She and her staff at the Audubon Nature Institute have been working quietly for years on the science and the art of interspecies cloning. And she'll be the first to tell you that even with living animals, it isn't easy. You don't just clone some cells and then all of a sudden you have a baby. Yeah. I mean, there's so many scientific steps along the way, knowing everything from hormones to the proper surrogate to, you know, length of pregnancy. Length of pregnancy. Yeah, because see, we don't know how long a woolly mammoth, the gestation period. We can guess, but we don't know really. But Betsy Dresser's work on interspecies cloning is focused on the future, not the past. Rather than trying to resurrect extinct creatures, her goal is to keep the animals we have today from going extinct tomorrow. I feel like we're in the emergency room of the wildlife business, really. I don't want to see elephants in textbooks or, you know, the way we see dinosaurs. <laughs> we're going to lose a lot of species if we don't do something about it. Dresser and her team are trying to increase the populations of endangered animals by putting their DNA into the eggs of their non-endangered relatives. This cat's going to act as a surrogate mother. And so, here's the surgery. On the day we visited, they were laparoscopically removing eggs from an ordinary house cat, then sending the eggs down the hall to have the house cat DNA literally sucked out of them. Yeah. Oh, tell me what's happening. What she's doing is she's removing the DNA from this domestic cat egg. Wow. And she can see it by what we call fluorescing it. It becomes just very blue. And so now she knows where it is, and now you'll see her go in there and be able to remove it. She's taking out all the genes. Right. Once the house cat DNA is out, that's it being deposited outside of the egg. They will replace it with the DNA of an endangered Arabian sand cat, a completely different species gathered from a tiny piece of skin. And there you see it being inserted into the domestic cat egg. And you made that from just skin? Just from skin cells, right. An electrical pulse starts the egg dividing, and if all goes as planned, the now sand cat embryo will be put back into the domestic cat to grow to term. It's worked before with African wildcats. These two are both interspecies clones, so normal, they even mated the old-fashioned way and produced kittens. Eight kittens altogether. We had a couple litters. And they're totally healthy, and they're African wildcats. Wildcats, totally African wildcats, totally healthy. And it said to us, hey, this works. And now that we know we can do it, we can say to the world, these animals do develop, they do reproduce naturally, and we can use this as a tool for endangered species. Is she hissing at us? Yeah, she's hissing at us. <laughs> and Dresser is working her way up. Her next interspecies cloning project will use this non-endangered caracal cat as a surrogate mother for an endangered lynx. And after that, the eland antelope as a surrogate for its endangered cousin, the bongo. You know, there are still people who get nervous at the idea of cloning. They think there's something wrong about it. And I'll tell you what, if I have to choose cloning or extinction, I'm going to choose cloning. But I want to be darn sure that I know how to do it. And if we don't do it while we have the animals now to be able to learn how to do it, then we're not going to have a choice. It's not going to be an option. So to keep her options open while she's mastering interspecies cloning, she's also putting as many animals as she can on ice. Literally. Dresser is the keeper of a new kind of zoo, a frozen zoo, where she's collecting tiny skin samples from thousands of different animals, representing hundreds of species and is storing them at 343 degrees below zero in tiny canisters inside these tanks filled with liquid nitrogen. We've got lions and tigers. We've got gorillas and rhinos. We've got little frogs. All of the animals Everything that people know from in from this zoos. size to this size. To this size, exactly. So how long can a piece of skin be viable? We think these cells can sit here for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. So. If any one of these animals were to go extinct, mm -hmm. you could bring them back. Right? In theory, I believe we can. In other words, it's, it's kind of a Noah's Ark. Yeah. It's not a zoo, it's an ark. <laughs> it's an ark, <laughs> truly. Do you think we're at the stage where we should be taking every single wild animal 
even if they're not endangered, and putting them in a frozen zoo? Yes, I absolutely do. Every single one. What have we got to lose? I think we should put every species in that we can while we have the opportunity. Which raises the question, with so many living animals today threatened, why think about resurrecting extinct ones like the mammoth? To bring the woolly mammoth back, I mean, we don't have enough space for the big animals we already have. These projects like the woolly mammoth, they inspire people to think about the meaning of what we're doing here. And why would you invest years and years of your life in trying to bring back a woolly mammoth or taking care of them if you did? That's an excellent question. I think it would fire up people's imaginations. And I think there's somewhere, there's a nine-year-old girl watching this program and listening to this saying, that's what I want to do. I want to bring back these creatures that are extinct. Or I want to protect creatures that are now threatened from going extinct. So in many ways, I think the woolly mammoth can sort of be a, you know, a poster animal for a general effort of being more conscious of uh, our activities on the planet. No one has yet found the intact cell it would take to resurrect that poster animal. But in Siberia four years ago, a reindeer herder discovered a remarkably well-preserved one-month-old baby mammoth that had lain frozen in permafrost for 40,000 years. Its DNA was in better shape than any previously found, raising hopes that between new finds and new technology, it may just be a matter of time. <laughs> Betsy Dresser stepped down as director of the Audubon Research Center recently to work on a book about endangered species and new technology. She continues to consult on the center's work, which is ongoing.